hello. So I'm not Yodok, as uh, it may have just been clear if, if anyone was wanting to see him. I do apologize. But uh, so we're going to look at um, an open source uh, piece of software that we've created at Crate. And it's a distributed database. And we're going to look at how to handle distributed databases with Docker. That said, other containers are available. Other distributed databases are available, but they're the specific ones we're going to focus on and how we got to what we created and why, and then how we have, the recommended way we've solved that, well, solved is a big word, but helped with the uh, distributed uh, database solutions within uh, a Docker or container context. So, a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from London, I lived in Australia for a while and now in Germany. I'm actually a developer advocate for Crate, somewhere between technical and non-technical. So I'm going to mainly talk about uh, how, to use what, how to use the database, how to integrate with it and how it functions. And I actually have one of our core team here who will help answer any of the more technical questions you might have about how Crate is actually made, because that may interest you and it's not, not questions I can answer. <laughs> Um, and I've always loved open source. Um, I've worked in open source software for about 15 years, mainly in a more traditional field. Um, and I also have been working on other applications of open source, like a uh, board game and works of fiction. So uh, a bit of a generalist, I guess. So let's start with the sort of big statements and why we took ourselves down the path of building a distributed database, another distributed database. Um, the founders of Crate come from a long background of scaling large applications. And basically, for applications of any type of size and scale, now having one database is not enough anymore. I think we all know that here. Um, we can't scale it quick enough. It's not resilient enough. It's not dynamic enough to cope with the sorts of applications we're now creating. Um, and of course, the solution to this is distributing the multiple instances of a database and then multiple ways of keeping those multiple instances synchronized. And we'll look at some of those in a minute. Along the same lines, in respect to uh, this presentation, traditionally, and I use the word traditionally loosely because tradition in computer programming is not very long ago, really. Um, data centers would be the way we would scale applications. We needed more capacity, we would build another data center. That's not an easy thing to do. It requires a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of very specialized skills. Um, so we then got to the step of virtualization and cloud computing, which is a bit of a, a buzzword, if you forgive the pun. But um, we understand what that means. Computers and... Uh, instances of computers that we can access very easily and very quickly when we need them and add capacity when we need them. Then, more recently, we've had things like containers. Again, not a new concept, but the concept has been understood and more widely used in the past 18 months even. Uh, and finally, we're ending up with something like compute services, something like Lambda, AWS Lambda, where we've even reduced the overhead of services we require for our application even more to small, discrete little services that do one particular thing for a very quick amount of time, and come and go as quickly as we need them. And this uh, slide is thanks to, or well, this concept of where we're going is thanks to uh, Adrian Cockroft, who's ex-Netflix, and that's a company that understands complex scaling, I, I guess. Streaming video is pretty hard. And traditionally, when we've needed to uh, change our requirements in an application or increase it in size, we've sort of followed this path. This is a, a path that many developers have followed in the past, and I would guess that many are here. We start with something traditional. Again, there's that word again. A relational database, something like MySQL. Um, we need more capacity on that MySQL database. We add more instances, which is great. But then we have to worry about master and node setups, sharding, keeping the information in synchronization, 
uh, and how we're going to do that. We realized then we need some document storage, so we had a document storage solution, and then we need to keep those two pieces working together, and again, scaling and synchronizing. Then we need search, to search across those two databases. And again, when we need to add capacity, we now have three pieces all interlocking with each other and figuring out how to scale and synchronize. And then we might add more and more and more. And all of this is, of course, possible to synchronize and scale, but it becomes more and more complicated and we spend less and less time on actually building a good application and it hasn't really solved the problem that we were trying to solve in the first place. We're just creating more problems for ourselves, which sometimes we like to do, but... <laughs> and um, with containers and with Docker, in this specific example, Keeping data persistent in containers. Here's a concept where we have an instance of a, a compute service or an instance of an application or an instance of a database that we may add to, we may remove. We may remove all of them and double the capacity. How, when these things are transient, do we keep data persistent? How does a new instance know what the data even was and where to find it from a previous instance? And again, there are solutions, but they're not simple. They take time, and depending on the complexity of your application, they could take a lot of time. This is kind of where we are, and why we decided to try something new, or a new alternative anyway. Um, and Crate is an open source project, and I'll show you some of the component stack in a minute. There's mountains everywhere because it started in uh, Austria, actually. Uh, we now sort of half German, half Austrian, with a couple of other ethnicities thrown in, of course. Uh, it started out originally as working on Elasticsearch plugins about four years ago, when the um, founders realized actually what they were working on could be more than that, and decided to break it out into a separate um, open source project. Um, still contributing back to Elasticsearch along the way, and we'll have a look at some of those contributions in a minute. So what is it? And this slide is interesting because my colleague and I were in a previous talk where lots of the things we do, <laughs> there was a, a contradictory opinion on them. So, <laughs> so, but we've sort of taken some of them a bit further. You get a lot of different features and functionalities all combined into one package, basically. So it's a NoSQL style architecture, but you can actually use standard SQL for your query language. You don't have to learn any new querying languages if you're migrating from something like MySQL. Um, it's distributed SQL. So the various instances of the data can be queried with one normal style SQL query. And it doesn't matter too much where the data is, you'll get the same results, and we'll look at a demonstration of that soon. We have semi-structured records. The structures and the schema can change relatively easily, and a whole bunch of other features here. And the, I guess one of the key, um, the key features that we have by default, which can be changed through configuration, is that all nodes are equal. There is no master-slave concept by default. At extreme scale, you may need to start changing that, but at medium scale, you can generally stick with this type of infrastructure. Um, I think the one thing that isn't noted on there is as well that document storage and normal database storage are also included in the same package. So you don't have these multiple technologies interlocking with each other they're all in the same uh, crate instances, as it were. So what's underneath everything? As I say, uh, crate itself is open source, but it builds upon other open source components. Um, the ones in gray, are the light gray, are Elasticsearch. So we're using Elasticsearch at the storage layer. Um, and the dark gray are other components. The blue are custom crate components that we have created ourselves, but they're all um, open sourced. So all of this is viewable and um, contributable. 
So the crate component and the storage level is handling blob storage. Lucene is handling index storage and Elasticsearch, pretty much everything else. At the network layer, again, custom crate components for blob streaming, Elasticsearch for sharding, discovery, and transport, and uh, Netty for the internode communication. At the aggregation level, so the distributed uh, level, it's all custom crate. At the query level, we're using Facebook Presto to parse the SQL. Elasticsearch for the scatter gather, and um, I guess one of the most useful crate components is the bulk import export for migration into and out of, which hopefully you won't need, but into hopefully you will need. And at the top, again, all custom with uh, the dashboard, which we'll look at soon, a Python shell, and then various client libraries, which we'll also have a quick look at for programming languages. Okay, so that's a quick overview. Let's now look into how it fits in with uh, lovely Docker. Um, and I think this is always something I have to be clear of. We've decided to talk a reasonable amount about how Crate works with Docker, but it works with many other containers and also without containers as well. It's important to point out you don't need Docker. But Docker is also very good for demos because I don't need to have anything... Um, special setup on a computer, you can just get it running immediately. So, anyone who's used Docker will probably recognize this sequence of commands. It's basically saying, get the latest image, then run it. And the first two are running the crate, creating a new crate container and letting Docker handle the port allocation. The final one is then letting us manually set the ports to the two ports that we like to use. And I'm not going to just leave that up there. I'm actually going to do this. So we can see how it... It's always the challenge of finding a mouse pointer. There it is. All right. Okay. Now, I think I have done this demo enough that I can remember this without having to copy and paste it. But <laughs> we'll see. I've already um, done the first step. I didn't want to rely on uh, conference Wi-Fi to pull the image down. We're already... And the dash D is... Uh, so it runs in the background, basically. So. Okay. Then we'll run it again. We'll run it a third time, and I'll explain what has, what has happened here. So, we run the uh, command, the Docker command, to list the uh, instances we now have, and we have three instances of crate running. Um, and as you can see from here, we've let these are the two where we let Docker allocate the ports, and here is the one where we statically said we want to use these ones. And because we're on the same host, um, they will all discover each other, and we'll have a three instance. Cluster. Let's just refresh that, and there it is. And you can see the three up. I don't think my laser pointer actually works, unfortunately. No. <laughs> you can see the three up in the sort of middle to top right. And there's nothing in here at the moment. I'll give you our sort of hello world demo. We'll import some tweets, and then I'll give you a very quick overview of this admin console. I don't really need to do too much. So this is the admin console. I mean, it's good for getting up and running, but to be honest with you, once you start creating a more complex application, it becomes less useful, I guess, apart from just an overview. It gives us an overview of the data we have. This health indicator is an indicator of how the instances of the database are rebalancing. When, um, so this is currently telling us that all three nodes in the cluster have the same data. And in a later example, we'll start destroying some instances, and you'll see it rebalancing. But this is so, such a small data set that it's not, nothing's really happening. Um, we have a console, which just lets us do some basic uh, playing around with queries. Oops. Yep. 
as you'd expect. Um, we can see the table structure we have here, also blob tables if we had any, and the, uh, usually the schema is, well, it's gone anyway, and the cluster. All reasonably straightforward, not a particularly uh, thorough example, so we'll step up to something a little more complex. I think I will jump straight into it and then I will um, talk through in a bit more detail. So this is not the one I wanted, no, it's this one. <laughs> and they all look the same sometimes. <laughs> That's the one I wanted. Okay, so this is um, a larger cluster on AWS. We currently have 11 nodes. We have 666, 660 even, million records. A little bit more of an interesting data set. We have the main table we're interested in is the steps. It's a, a, a faux step tracker application. So it has steps taken by users each day. We have 50 gig of data and you can also see why I can't seem to scroll down to anything. Which is <laughs> there's things down here which I want to show you, but I can't get to them for some reason. Uh, normally, down on that right-hand side, you'd also see partition data and the schema, but I'm not entirely sure why it's not scrolling there. Okay, let's run some queries on this, and then we'll illustrate the, um, the distributed nature and what that means, really. So I'm going to log into the... You know, I'll run a query first, sorry. So in this instance, we are... In this instance, we're looking at the number of steps for a user and adding the sum of all the steps for a particular user. And we've got about 50 to 60 gig of data. That's reasonably quick. We normally get that kind of number, 0.018 seconds. Great. That's great. Let's try something a little bit more complicated. This will take the, uh, the steps from that user again, and then um, for a particular month and give the total for each day. It's a little bit more complicated, but still pretty quick. Let's remember those numbers, 0.012 seconds. I think that's actually the quickest it's done it at so far, which is good, I suppose. Okay, great. Let's go back to the overview, and what we're gonna do is firstly, I'm going to recreate an instance of the cluster and bring it up to 12. And this is going to look complicated. And there's a reason I'm sort of making it look complicated to illustrate a later point. But we'll log into the, um, the AWS instance. And I want to switch into here. And at the moment, there is, yeah, there's nothing running on this one. This, this one is doing nothing at the moment. So we're going to create a new instance. Okay. This, now this comes back to uh, what I alluded to earlier in that the service discovery going on between the nodes generally will only work if everything's on the same um, host. And this is a, a slight restriction with, um, with Docker, but it's also a slight restriction with a lot of cloud hosting. And this is why we're starting with problems, because we're going to talk through the solutions to these problems. But th and this is one solution, but it's a fairly long-winded one. So we have to get the uh, publishable IP address from AWS. We have to get all the hosts in the cluster. And then we can run this uh, command, which I will clear. Even though it's on a slide, I'll just talk it through here. So this is, again, running it 
with the static port, it's, they're all on separate hosts, separate uh, instances, so we don't have to worry about port conflicts. We're mapping it to an existing data directory that exists on disk already. This is keeping that persistence. The data is already there. Nothing's happening with it, but it's already there available for us to reuse. We're setting a, a, a heap size because we've got a large data set. And here we've got some um, configuration options that we're actually sending to Crate itself. And some of these are recognizable from the under, underlying Elasticsearch and some others that are Crate specific. So that has, uh, that has run already. Okay. So we go back to our cluster, and we now have 12. And because I was so slow in explaining things, we didn't see the rebalancing. But when we destroy it, it'll be a lot quicker and we could see it rebalancing. But if we go and run some of the same queries, we'll see that that took slightly longer. That's interesting. <laughs> but um, we've got the same data set, even though we just introduced a new instance. OK, great. Let's, let's have some fun. Let's actually destroy things. Just find the ID. And let's watch the screen in the background. As fun as terminals are, watch the uh, thing in the background. So we're killing this instance. There we go. And we see the overview suddenly switch into warning, and that we don't have fully, replicat fully replicated data at the moment. And it's jumping up, and if I can move quick enough, we can actually jump into the table level and see specifically what table is under-replicated as well. Uh, I would hazard a guess pretty soon, definitely by the end of the talk, everything will be rebalanced. But I, I hope from that example you see the point of the simplicity here. We've got a distributed set of nodes of a database that we can bring up and down at will or when something goes wrong, and we don't have to worry too much about that synchronization and replication. It's happening automatically for us. Oh, there we go, 100%, great. Okay, so that was, um, that's very useful at the, uh, at, um, as an example, but we wanted to talk about how, how to do this better with Docker. So I'm gonna take a slight diversion back a step and then we'll get to a better solution than doing this sort of, this is great, it works, setting these host names manually, but it's not as dynamic as it could be. Let's um, jump back into, okay. So very quickly coming back, um, we have client libraries for most programming languages some created by our team, some created by community, and others improved by community as well. Um, and as we've already mentioned, there's familiar SQL, so if you're thinking of switching from something that pre-exists that's SQL style, then the development team doesn't have to relearn anything completely. Um, I will show you, yeah, I will do this very quickly. I'd like to get on to the more Docker-specific things. But as an example, I have three uh, code examples here of um, fairly simple applications, but they're using that same data set um, of how you would start to use the, the, the database in your application. So here's a very simple Python example. Um, it's, it's supposed to emulate the steps being increased. So it generates a random amount of steps and a timestamp and writes it to the database. That's basically all it's doing, but it's a reasonably real world example. Um, and I guess you could see from the top here that we have a specific client adapter for Python and it gives you some functionality to connect to the database, but then it largely comes down to making SQL style uh, execution statements. I will run this because there's one other factor about, um, about 
the nature of Crate and the way it works, and this may be a question you'd like to ask in a bit more detail, is we are what is called eventually consistent. To keep that speed and performance, data obviously, it's not magic, data has to synchronize somehow and it takes some time. So I'm gonna run this Python example to illustrate the fact that we create a new record, query for that record, but it's not actually there yet. Um, so again, I'm intentionally doing something wrong to sort of illustrate a point, but let me just um, remember what I've called it. So, okay. so this will just generates the random timestamp, generates the steps. I've, I've written to the database and I've queried the database for that line, but it's, it's not available yet. As we saw, this is that same database we saw on the AWS cluster. It took a few minutes to synchronize. If we came back later, we'd be able to query for it. But let's illustrate the point that the data isn't available immediately, and the negatives and positives of that type of infrastructure we'll come back to at the end of the presentation. We also have, uh, again, a fairly basic node example. Again, there's a library available. The node libraries are probably some of the, um, some of the uh, more thorough implementations as well. We connect to the instance. Here we have, um, with a sort of more simple query, we can do this sort of structure of querying, what columns we want, the query we want, the limit we want, and we just log it to console. And if we want something a bit more complicated, we, at the moment, as a, all of these are open source, so open to improvement, we have to run a, a standard sort of SQL query. And again, I mean, this will be... Yeah, as you'd expect, it outputs the results of the queries to console. That's all it was doing. But this is all to that live database. And one final example, which I'm moderately happy with, is an Android example. I'll get the emulator running whilst I'm explaining through it. <laughs> the emulator has got faster, but maybe we'll come back to it later. But here, I'm just querying the HTTP endpoint we have available. Normally, with um, an application, you probably wouldn't do that. You'd have your own back end, but this is just a demo. So, and demos aren't the real world. But just to show you an example of how, if there isn't a client library, there is an HTTP endpoint available, and you can just issue, again, queries to it, as we can see here. And this, again, is doing much the same. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I don't think I've got time for that. <laughs> so, but it just pulls that list of records and displays them in a list. And actually, the Android emulator is very slow, but the application and the query comes back very fast. So it's a shame <laughs> that, uh, that it lets me down. A bit. Oh, here we go. There we go. It's not too bad. And you always have to, there we go. So that's the same data set. Again, there's no fancy visualization, but it's pretty quick. And this is an emulated phone as well, so there's all that lack of performance there. So anyway, that's some very quick coding examples. Let's get back to, uh, to Docker. So very quickly, I'm going to look at Compose. This is uh, Docker's way of um, creating um, like a, a text description of the, the components in your application infrastructure. And I use this, it's a very basic example, but just because, of course, if you're going to be creating uh, a microservice type application of many parts, something like this helps you just construct that. Um, and here's how you would do some of those custom uh, commands with, uh, with uh, Crate. But here's where we want to really get to. Machine and swarm. So Docker machine is its tool of creating virtual machines very easily. It's not that hard to create uh, virtual machines 
without Docker Machine, but it makes it even simpler, and you can choose the various um, uh, drivers you want to use, be it VirtualBox, AWS, DigitalOcean, and a whole bunch of other options. And this is all fairly standard. I'm not going to run this code. I'm kind of reaching a conclusion here, but just to illustrate the steps along the way. So when that comes in more useful is when we want to create um, Swarm. Now, Docker Swarm is a way of creating multiple Docker machines and then grouping them together. And this is kind of where we want to go. This is what we were looking at. We want to create a fully distributed database that is everything is aware of each other. Um, and when we remove and add instances, the data is synchronized. That is the point. And Docker Swarm feels like we could take us, take us there. But if we're on multiple hosts, we have that same problem. There are ways around it. We saw um, the manual declaration earlier. And um, you can automate that through a bash script or something like that. But it's still maybe more complicated than it really needs to be. So this is just going through some of those steps. We create uh, a discovery token of the, uh, the master in the swarm. We then create um, the master, give it the token, and add it to the swarm. We then start creating the, um, the, the, the nodes or the slaves, give them the same token. And at that point in time, theoretically, we could then go Docker info and we'd see a list of all the nodes and masters in that swarm. But if we're on AWS or if we're on any other cloud hosting, it's not going to work unless, again, we do something like this that we saw earlier, which is fine, but yeah. So I guess our recommended way at the moment of making this truly distributed database with, with uh, Docker is we at the moment are using something called Weave. Uh, I'm not going to step through all the points, but I'll show you the end result. But here's the blog post that I basically followed to create this example. So Weave is a software-defined networking technology. Uh, it integrates with Docker and is pretty easy to use. And it lets you create overlay networks over all your other networks to um, basically enabling multicast to work in. It claims any cloud. That's a big claim. We'll say most clouds. So let's have a quick look at how that looks. So in this instance, we've used um, Compute Engine. We have three Weave, three Weave instances, three instances in this demonstration down here, all of diff different IP addresses, different machines. Normally, if we then ran uh, Crate and Docker on those, they wouldn't be able to find each other. We've installed Weave on each one and got them uh, communicating through the same channels, and we end up with um, this. And this, this is the end result. Uh, again, I've imported a few tweets into it. We have the three instances, which are the same three we can see at the bottom of that list. And that's it. It doesn't really look any different, but <laughs> but there are three nodes on three different uh, machine machines, all communicating with each other. Um, and if you follow that blog post here, it's reasonably straightforward to get it to get it working. And we truly have a distributed database across networks and across cloud networks as well. It's a slightly underwhelming <laughs> sort of end point, but <laughs> it looks exactly the same, but that is what we have there. So just to, uh, to wrap up and have some time for questions, and if you have any more questions we don't have time to answer, I will be here tomorrow as well. Um, so what are the use cases for this? Let's start with the negatives. Systems that require strong consistency. We have that eventual consistency. So anything that you 100% need the record to be available the very second it's been written, then no. And there are use cases where that would be the case. Say, for example, financial, banks, something like that. Equally, the same applies with transactions. Um, Crate will keep going when, uh, when queries fail, which may mean that other subsequent queries are not accurate anymore. And with a lot of uh, application structures, that's fine. But there are many that that isn't fine. 
and strong relational data. Um, currently, uh, we don't support proper joins, but they're coming very soon. Um, we're sort of ironing out the kinks in the performance that that uh, affects, but they're coming very soon. So that's on the negative, but on the positive, things like high volume, semi-structured data that changes all the time, Internet of Things applications, big data applications. We have um, a lot of people using it for business intelligence, marketing intelligence. So data that is just coming all the time and is changing all the time, and the, the amount that it comes in at is changing all the time. And uh, because of that SQL um, type language, it's very easy to, to migrate from MySQL or something like that if that's what you've been using. So uh, I hope that was a reasonable summary of the concept and how to get it working. Here's some of our contact details. Also have some lovely t-shirts and stickers and all that kind of um, stuff if anyone wants any. And uh, I've got a few minutes for questions.